Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I feel a connection with this church. Met with Terry, saw Terry Maxudian the other night. Her father, Armour Potter, was pastor at San Marcos when I was at Escondido. And he was not just a colleague, he was a very good friend. And when he had something he needed help with, he would call me and ask me to pray with him and, and get counsel. And I would call him when I had some issues in my church and he would give me counsel. And so there's that connection. Anna Marie, I found out that her sister Jeannie is a member at Corona Church, and so I have that connection. And the Rathbuns were members at Corona before I was even there. And he spoke to me today, and we met before. So there's that connection. And then I found out that uh, somebody's a hiker and hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, if I got that right. And at the age of 50, I got hooked into backpacking, and I was able, over a period of time, to hike the John Muir Trail. And you're having a mission trip to Fiji, and in 2010, I was able to do a mission trip to Fiji with my Corona Church family. So we have a connections. It's a small world indeed. I want to uh, just begin by sharing a custom I have, and I haven't forgotten the scripture, it's coming. But many pastors, and this is fine, they pray before they preach their sermon. And I have been praying about that, we prayed before. But one time when I was reading through Paul's letters, it dawned on me that every time before he wrote a letter, he gave a word of, of blessing to those who would read it. And so I've developed it as a habit of mine. Before I preach, I pronounce a blessing upon the church family that's gathered wherever I preach. So, may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, May he make you complete, as the Laguna, Laguna Seventh-day Adventist Church, may he make you complete in every good work, to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory. May his mercy, grace, and peace be with you today. T Terry, would you please read the scripture for this morning? Go ahead. We will be reading passages from Genesis 3 8, Exodus 25 8, John 1 14, and Revelation 21 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Um, I don't know what time you usually get out. I notice what time it is. If I run over a little bit today late, will there be forgiveness and grace for a guest speaker? Thank you. <laughs> and a little child shall lead them. Okay? So while they're working on getting, I'm not going to wait. Hopefully they'll get the uh, PowerPoint up and going. Um, Ah, it's going there, it's not back there. And this is not working. Okay, you're going to have to slide it forward for me. Okay? So if you move to the next slide. Ah, there we go. When I was at Corona one time, I did a survey of some of my key spiritual leaders. And I asked them what they thought the most frequent theme or promise in the Bible was. Eight of them said the unconditional love of God. 
Six of them said salvation. If you can kind of keep going with me, I would appreciate it. There we go. Six of them said salvation. Okay? Three of them said end time events. Two of them said the vindication of the character of God. And the last two were a tie. Jesus was one, and Jesus always trumps anything else. And the relationship between God and man. But in my study over the years of the word, I found that there is one other theme or promise in scripture that is more prominent than even those. At the same time, that theme or promise really includes and encompasses everything that was said there and more. And this is that theme. God desires to dwell with us. That's the theme. It is the biggest theme in all of Scripture. I don't know if you've, I'm sure you have, seen some of the pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, if you've seen pictures from the Webb Space Telescope. Do you realize how insignificant this planet is in the scheme of things? We, we serve a God who created this vast excuse me, this vast, vast universe. And yet that God says that his greatest desire is to dwell with you and to dwell with me and to dwell with us. Doesn't that amaze you? Doesn't that just overwhelm you? Shouldn't that just make us go, who are we, as the psalmist said, that you would be mindful of us? I, I want you to notice that God doesn't just desire to dwell with us individually. He also wants to dwell with us collectively. John Ortberg, in his book, God is Closer Than You Think, and he's got kind of a subtitle, this can be the greatest moment of your life because... This moment is the place where you can meet God. Long title. But I want you to notice what he said. His assertion was the central promise in the Bible is not, I will forgive you. Although, of course, that promise is there. It is not the promise of life after death, although we, offered, they, we are offered that as well. The most frequent promise in the Bible is, I will be with you. I will be with you. God desires to be present with humanity. Why? Because he created us out of love. He created us out of love. Genesis 3.8, it says that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Now this is after sin, we know that. But it, when it says that, it says God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, but Adam and Eve hid because they'd sinned against God. They would only be hiding if that wasn't the usual practice. Now, I know I have an imp, a finite mind and God is infinite. I don't know how God can be ever present, and I know he's spirit and how he would walk with them, but it doesn't matter. He was present with them regularly. And from the very beginning, it was God's design, not just to create man and walk away, but to create man and women, okay, and to have a relationship with them, to be with them. And from the very beginning in Genesis, we see that God wanted to dwell. Centuries pass, a flood happens, God creates a, a, a family unit through whom he's going to tell the world about who he is. They go off into slavery, and God brings them out of slavery. And then in, in Exodus 25, 8, God tells Moses to build a tabernacle so that he could do what? Dwell among them. And he didn't just dwell in the tabernacle. He wasn't just the Shekinah glory over the ark. He was also the pillar of, cl of cloud during the day to protect them from the sun and the heat, and he was the, the pillar of fire by night to light the camp. And throughout the centuries, God over and over again found ways to dwell among them, sending prophets and, and, and kings and, and priests so that he could be with them. And when they went against him, 
they found it was hard for him to give them up. He kept pleading with them, please return to me so I can be with you again. In Psalm 139, 7, the rhetorical question is asked, where, the psalmist asked, and it was David, where shall I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? And the answer is, you can't. There's nowhere you can go where God won't be there. There's nowhere you can flee to escape his presence. Why? Not just because he is the omnipresent God who's everywhere, but because he longs and wants to dwell with us, to be present with us. In the New Testament, the same theme is covered. In introducing Jesus in the book of John, John says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And if you're not aware, it's the same word for tabernacle in the Old Testament. Jesus made his tabernacle among us, and we have beheld his glory, seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the ultimate way that God said he's going to dwell with us. And he did that through the Incarnation. Just before Jesus was about to leave and before he's going to be crucified and then resurrected and then shortly after that returned to heaven, he told his disciples, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him. But notice the last sentence of that verse. But you know him because he remains with you and in you. Some translations say he dwells within you. Some say he places, makes his residence in you. The interesting thing is that word for remains in the Greek is the word meno. It's the same word that Jesus uses in John 15 when he says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Now, some of the translations, when they talk about the word abide in John 15, they use remain or dwell. I don't know about you, but there's something about that word that ab abide that just means so much more to me. It is a deep, deep relationship. It, it, it is a, a relationship that we should experience to our core. It is the sense of abiding for the purpose of growth and, and nurture and strength and power. It's not just that he lives in the house with us, it's that he's there by our side every step of the way. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who will dwell within you. You may not know this, we haven't emphasized it much. But in baptism, we are told that anyone who is baptized into Christ, when they are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit. That's not an if. We do. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit is dwelling within you and the Spirit is dwelling within me. There's a saying that says oftentimes when Christians meet, the Spirit in me recognizes the Spirit in you. And you don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist to recognize or meet somebody who's not a Seventh-day Adventist to recognize the Spirit in them because that happens too. And so Jesus said, I will send you the Spirit to dwell in you because God wants to dwell with us. And then in Revelation 21, speaking of that time when Jesus comes again, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself, that's emphatic, the real God, the true God, God himself will be with them, will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. In one verse, in one sentence, in four different phrases, God says, I'm going to dwell with my people forever. Who do you think is looking forward to the second coming of Jesus more? You and I are God. If there's one thing we haven't figured out much, 
we think sin causes great pain to us as human beings. God has had to endure the results of sin for centuries, for thousands of years. And, and Revelation tells us that God's going to wipe away the tears from our eyes when there's no more sin, death, sorrow, or, or pain, or heartache. I've often asked, and I know God doesn't have eyes, he's spirit, but who's going to wipe away the pain from God's eyes? Will it ever go away? This God doesn't wait until you and I are good enough to dwell with us. If he did, none of us would have any hope. He says, even while we were, the scriptures use enemies, even while we were enemies, Christ died for us. God's great desire is to dwell with us. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you believe that it is God's desire to dwell with you today? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that it is God's desire to dwell with the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church today? Yes. I want to read, go back to creation a bit. Famous picture of Michelangelo that he painted on the Sistine T Chapel. You don't have that? Did you get the old one? Ah, Okay. Go ahead and put the picture up. Isaiah 43, 1 reminds us. But now thus says the Lord God, He create, who created you, O Jacob, that's God's people. He who formed you, O Israel, that's God's people. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Throughout the Bible, we are told that God wants to dwell within us. Okay? I guess the Sistine Chapel's later and misunderstood. Okay? We got, oh, there it is. God said, let us make man in our image. Okay? I want to go back to that because it's important. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then God created man. In the image of God, he created him. God's image is an image of oneness, Father, Son, and Spirit. God's image is God the Father, God the Son working together. God the Spirit working together. And he created us because when he created us, there's an aspect of our creation we often overlook. He created us to belong to him. And when he created Adam and Eve, he created them to belong to each other. Do you realize how important belonging is? If you don't know that you belong to your parents, it creates havoc in your life. If your parents don't treat you as if you belong, it creates emotional disturbance in your life. Do you know that you belong to God? And he created us with this need for, for fellowship. It's not good that man should be alone. So yes, he created Eve. That was the only other person in the world at that time. But he also created us to belong to one another. He created us to belong to one another. That's why Isaiah 43, 1 says... The Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. You are mine. We belong to God. And because we belong to God, we belong to one another. As you look around this sanctuary this morning and look at each other, you can do that. You don't have to look at me. Every person you look at, if they've accepted Jesus Christ as a son or daughter of God, which makes them your brother or sister. Now you can look at me. Everyone in this sanctuary is a broken human being with a human nature that's still fallen and that God is still working on. And I am the chief of sinners. And in our brokenness, there are times when our brokenness comes out. And whether we intend to or not, we will hurt others. And one of the devil's biggest, biggest ploys 
is to get us to doubt that we belong to God and that we are His. I began ministry in 1974. In 1994, I was at a conference retreat. And someone brought up a book. I got the book and read it. It was called Abba's Child. And as I was reading that book, and I've gone back to the book to figure out where it was on that page, I can't find it. But there was one time I was reading it and I started sobbing because for the first time, yes, I knew I was called God's son. Yes, I was a pastor. Yes, I knew all that. I knew it up here. I didn't know it down here. Do you, do you get the difference? And for the first time, I recognized that I am a child of God. And one of the devil's biggest ploys is to try to get us to, to think we're not his child. To doubt that. Think about Jesus' uh, temptations in the wilderness. What was the first temptation? What was it? You're wrong. The first temptation was this. If you are the Son of God. He said that every time. The biggest doubt was not about whether he should make stones into bread. It wasn't about whether or not he should cast himself off the temple. It wasn't about whether he should bow down and worship. The biggest temptation was, do you doubt that you belong to God? Because here's what happens. When we are in doubt about whether we, are really, we really belong to God, we will doubt whether we really belong to each other. I can prove it. I can't prove it by saying I read this in a study somewhere. But there are sometimes you hear something or you come up with, and I've not heard this anywhere else, but sometimes you come up with something and when you share it with somebody, you don't have to prove it. You just know it's true. You've had that experience, right? Here's what I'd like to share with you this morning. Sometimes when we're not sure that we belong, we have to prove that others don't. Racism is proving I belong by proving someone of another race doesn't. Genderism is I can prove I belong by proving women don't. Elitism is I prove I belong because of what I have and what you don't have. Intellectualism is I can prove I belong because of what I know and I can prove you don't because you don't know what I know. Did you understand what I'm saying? When you are secure in the fact that you belong to God, my experience has been, I don't have to agree with someone else and think they don't belong to God either. God is a judge, I am not. This belonging, this, this idea that God longs to dwell within us is key to what it means to be a son or daughter of God. My security is not in, do I know the 28 fun? Don't, please don't think I don't. It's not whether or not I believe the 28 fundamentals. My security in God is knowing that I am the child of God by adoption because of what Jesus has done for me. That's my security. I fail to follow through on revealing the doctrines, if you will, too many times, living up to them, if you will. We all fail. What does it mean to belong? What it means to belong is to know that in spite of my sin and my mistakes and my errors, that God is a God of mercy and grace and I can come to him any time. Knowing that God can dwell within me. When, when I was a, a child and I was growing up in the Adventist church at that time, I had this picture in my mind <clears throat> that I was a yo-yo. And when I was good enough, the yo-yo was in God's hands. And the moment I sinned, 
The yo-yo was the sleeping dog at the bottom. Anybody else have that feeling? I am so glad I learned in Righteous by Faith that God is holding me in his hands all along. All along. I want to remind you of something which tells us about how much we need to dwell in God or to allow God to dwell in us. You remember the story of the time when Moses was soon to die. He'd been leading Israel for 40 years. And now as he's close to the promised land with the Israelites, all those who were there the first time, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, they're gone. Moses is the only leader the Israelites had known. And he's going to die because of his own sin. And not, not, he's not going to enter the promised land because of his own sin. And in Deuteronomy 31, in Deuteronomy 31, Moses speaks to Israel one day. He says, I'm 120 years old. I can't go out and come in like I used to. And the Lord has told me I'm not going to cross over the Jordan, so I'm going to die soon. But the Lord your God himself will cross over before you. And then he promises them, as they're thinking about this terrible thing they're going to encounter when they go into Canaan and they're going to have to fight these nations that are stronger than them, people that are mightier than them, this task that they're going to have to do that they aren't capable of doing on their own. These are the words he tells them. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then he calls up Joshua to stand by his side. And he repeats it and adds to it. Be strong and of good courage for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And then he creates a song, and they sing it. And then he inaugurates or commissions Joshua before the people, and he says one more time, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Uh, okay, for the kids here, if mom and dad say something once, if they say it twice, but if mom and dad repeat something three times, is it time to listen up? God has repeated this three times. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be dismayed. I will be with you. Moses dies. He's buried. The Israelites mourn for 30 days. And then Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, writes that God appears to him. And he tells him that they're to go across to the Jordan. And they've got a, a task that they're not going to be able to accomplish apart for him. And God says to them in Joshua 1, verse 5, As I was, was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Does that sound familiar to you? And then Joshua stands before the people. And he commends them and he tells them that they need to hear God's words and meditate on God's words constantly. And then he says... God says through Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Not once, but not twice, not three times or four times, that's five times. Do you think they needed to hear that? Joshua talks to them gives them the plan, the process they're under, going to undergo. And the people answered Joshua and said, Listen, as we, um, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. 
I don't think that gave Joshua much courage. I mean, you should be smiling too. If you think about how the children of Israel obeyed Moses and followed Moses those years in the wilderness, that would not encourage. But I want you to notice what happens. The people then tell Joshua, Joshua, only be strong and of good courage. Why? Because the Lord is with you. God's greatest desire is to dwell in you and to dwell in me. God's greatest desire is to dwell in you as a church family. I want to remind you what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28. Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Do you believe that God's greatest desire is to dwell in you individually and as a church family? Yes, in spite of our individual and collective mistakes and failures, the God of the universe, the God who can do far beyond whatever we could ask or think, he will dwell with you and with me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our gracious almighty God, you are the God that we belong to. You are the God, because we belong to you, we belong to each other. I pray your spirit will be with us today. As we leave this place, lead and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.